So I grew up in a predominantly white area um, in the 80s and uh, in South East London. And it was actually the area where Stephen Lawrence was um, killed in a racially motivated attack some years later. So it was the same postcode. So it had a real strong national front um, presence there. Um, my parents wanted to move there because it compared with other areas in, in a city, it was more towards Kent. So they thought it'd have nicer schools and it wouldn't be sort of so rough and sort of ghetto if you like. So that's why they wanted to move to, they wanted to move out further. So um, I was the only black kid at my school. There was a couple of Asian a brother and sister. Um, wow. but I was actually the only black kid in my school for many years. Um, and uh, my, my, brother, my brother's six years older than me. So by the time I started school, he had left. So from year one, that's when I experienced racism. And I had, I had lots of friends, but you know what kids are like, they're really mean. So if you fall out of a friend, you know what kids are like, you smell, I don't like you, but it, all, it was always directed at my color. So that was something I couldn't change. That was always, you know, um, various different um, things were said, but you know, the N word, the W word, and, you know, it didn't help that my parents, uh, my, you know, my mum braided my hair, so that was something else for them to take the, the mick out of me for as well. So, um, yeah, so that was my experience. Um, I think with, with children as well, um, yeah, kids are mean, and you want to fit in as a child as well. So it was really harsh, and I felt a lot of humiliation, and it was hurtful, deeply, deeply hurtful humiliation, um, I didn't trust people. I didn't know what their intentions were. And I think a lot of that still rubbed off on me today. You know, I don't forget, you know, as they say, words, um, words hurt more than sometimes physically, you know, physical, sorry, words hurt more than being physically hurt. They scar deeper. You so that deeper. was my experience. Um, yeah, that was my experience um, from year one, really from school. Um, as I got older, it did get better because obviously I was an older child. I was able to handle myself a lot more. But the early years of primary school were, were pretty hellish. Um, so, yeah, that was me. That must have been hard being the only black child in a school. I can't even begin to imagine. There was no teachers either. There was no teachers representing, you know, black teachers, even Indian teachers. So I had no one in my corner. Obviously, my mum and dad went up to school and I remember wanting to leave. And my dad said, you've got to be strong. But it was really oh. tough because no one could get it because everyone around me had white skin, you know? Yeah. Me, my first um, experience with racism um, was when I moved to London. So I basically moved to London from Nigeria when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think going back, to, I was in year seven and having kids, I had lots of friends, don't get me wrong, I was quite popular at school. But my first experience with racism was when kids, as you say, can be mean. Mm -hmm. And if they're not educated uh, to be diverse, mm -hmm. um, they can use racism as a form of uh, bullying. Yeah. And what I had was people say to me things like, how comes you're so posh and you're African? How comes you can speak English and you're African? I thought African people couldn't speak English. I thought African people were not posh. I thought African people didn't have money. Do you have monkeys where you live? Did you live with lions? Um, and why is your hair funny? Because I had like my Afro hair and it was really curly and they would want to touch it and feel it. And so for me, it was quite hard. But unlike you, I was lucky in my school, there was other black people in school. Um, but that was my first experience coming from a different country, expecting to come to London and expecting so much of London. And in fact, to be faced with that kind of, those kind of questions was quite challenging for a 12 year old. Wow. But then it did make me stronger, as you said. Where was your school? Where, where was your school located? I went to school in North London in Barnet, in High Barnet. Okay. Yeah, I went to school in High Barnet. And I've got great memories from school. Uh, but in terms of racism, that's when I first experienced it. I mentioned to you earlier was that Oscar had learned, has learned since lockdown how to play the Beatles song Blackbird on his guitar. And he's, it's such a beautiful song. He's been playing it, playing it. And I, 
I actually had a conversation before everything happened with George, you know, the, all, all of this situation had happened. I said to him, do you know what this song's about, Oscar? Yeah. And he was like, no. And I said, do you know, it's all about the, sort of bl the black trouble in America and when there was all the riots back in 1968. And that's where all that, what, that's what that song represents. Mm. And we had a whole chat about it. Um, and Oscar had said t tonight, Mommy, don't you think it's really strange that I learned that song and we were talking about it and then because obviously we've been talking about it lots more with all the media coverage and you know and rightly so we should be talking about it at home and and so when I wanted to speak sort of more about it with him and um and I and he sort of said to me I said do you understand you know like the whole it all sort of stems from the black slavery and and he said can I say something um, and I said, yeah, what do you need to say? And he was worried. He said, it disturbs me. And I said, what do you mean it disturbs you? He said, it disturbs me. I don't understand why you would treat other people like that because of the color of his, their skin. And that, they were his words. And that's the way he just... That's how he processed it. It's how he processed it. He, it disturbs him. And that's how power, and he, that's such a powerful word to say disturbs him. Like he just, in his mind, he just can't understand it. And I just think, we, how you make change, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. But one thing I do know is if you educate children, yeah, that's the layers, the foundation of where we need to make a start to make change, yeah. to understand. Absolutely. And just there's been a lot of talk about in the media about white privilege. Now, white privilege, I would say, is things like um, having to research a country before you go there to make sure it's black friendly, not feeling free, to, you know, to, to not saying you feel in prison, but you, you feel like restricted because worrying about going to a country to, 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 to see if sorry, I can't get my words out, but worrying about going to a country um, to um, ensure that you're not going to get any grief when you get there. Yeah. That's white privilege. Someone like you, Freak Nation, I'm not pointing the finger at you, 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 but, you know, you haven't ever got, you can go anywhere. I mean, I know we can go everywhere, okay, but you still have to consider things. Like, I remember when I went to LA, when I lived there when, in my early 20s, in certain parts of LA, if I went too deep, it was kind of... Um, like redneck so you had to not go in certain areas and to have to think that you have to worry about that it's, it's just stressful how can you live like that and I know you know maybe people would say oh don't you know it doesn't matter just go where you like but it's also sa your safety as well worrying about your safety and are you going to be safe are you going to be harmed and white privilege is not having to think about those things how do you interpret it Arefe? Um, I think for me, um, white privilege is about not having to think about something because of the color of your skin. Yeah. So when I say this, I mean like not having to, a white man doesn't have to worry about um, going for a run mm. and thinking I could be shot dead. This is something that our black men and, and women have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, a white man doesn't have to worry about being stopped by the police and being knelt on for eight minutes and 46 seconds, calling for your mother, saying you can't breathe because you've been stopped by the police. A white man doesn't have to worry about that when they get stopped by the police. Their heart rate doesn't go up every time a police car goes past. And, and anxiety of it. And well, anxiety of pain. Yeah. Exactly. And even with my kids, I notice that sometimes Carter sees the police and is thinking is is already a bit scared. And what I try to do is I try to see talk to police people in front of him. I say, not, not all cops are bad, not all police people are bad. And we have met lots of friendly police people. Uh, but going back to your question for me, that is what white privilege is. It's not having to think about your skin 
when you make decisions and where to go, things to do. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, what is the solution? I mean, you touched on it. Definitely education, educating parents, educating people, bringing black studies into schools. I think it's a lot better now. It's certainly, there was nothing there when I grew up at all. Um, but yeah, starting from grassroots, really. What would you say? Yeah, I, I never learned anything at school about it, actually. Like my knowledge of it growing up, I wasn't taught about black history. I think that definitely has to be part of a curriculum, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've learned is what I've learned myself and taught myself and read about, or, you know, watched, and always just watch and listen and, and learn. Like you always be open to learning. Like, that I mean I don't know how you change it but talking about it and listening mm. is and fun to build progress yeah do, do you know what something else that that um sorry Eureka what, what would you say no um, I would say very echoing kind of what you and Nesh have mentioned I would say um it's a very uncomfortable conversation uh, but it's a conversation that we all need to be having, white, black, Asians, everybody needs to be having this conversation. Um, there's a new generation uh, we are gro uh, that is rising right now, yeah. like our children, and we need to make sure that this uh, new generation is aware, is educated. Um, I'm raising two black boys and I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel like their life does matter. Um, and I think it's very important. I think the key is starting at a young age to really educate your children. Mm. And you can't just leave it up to school or the government. No. Us as moms and parents need to start educating our kids from a very young age. It's scary bringing up a, a, um, a son of, of colour. You know, your kids are black. My son's mixed race, but still he's mm -hmm. brown. He's, you know, he's brown skinned. Yeah. And I do worry when he gets older. I do. And particularly, I mean, I'd hate to be bringing up a child in America because mm -hmm. I actually thought about, I wanted to go out there, you know, for a while just to do my acting mm -hmm. things. But I, I actually fear him going out there. If I brought my son out there, would he get into trouble? Not that he's looking for it, but could, you know, it's so corrupt out there. But I shouldn't have to think about that. You know, it's, no, it's, not. it's awful. It's scary. Um, but yeah, Nesh, the other thing that I would really, I mean, I, I did message you last night and I said, I'm so not grateful, but you posted so many things on this whole Black Life Matters movement and it really touched me. Because I'm noticing that a lot of my non-white friends, and I'm not po po pointing the finger, non-black friends, sorry, um, have not even acknowledged it at all. And I don't know whether that's out of fear. I don't know whether it's because they don't know what to say. I know white people I think, it's both. I think it is definitely both of that. I think yeah. there, there was, I'm going to be honest, I was like, oh, because I hadn't posted anything pr prior to sort of Blackout Tuesday. And Tuesday came and I was like, I really feel like a hypocrite now if I now post it because I didn't post anything previous to it. Although, you know, you're aware of what goes on. And then I just thought, it's too big an issue to not mention or be moved or be affected by. Like, I live in London and, I, and I, I've grown up in a very diverse area. Mm. But it doesn't mean it still doesn't exist. Like, I and I just thought, no, I've I've got a voice, I've got a platform. I've only I've got five thousand followers, which isn't much, <laughs> but it's a it's a lot more than having nothing, right? So <laughs> for me, I just thought, no, I've I need to share. I'm still learning. I I'm still reading and you know listening. So you know what. I want to share that with other people to actually make them stop and think about it as well. I think everybody has a way of processing things. I think just because some, for me, the way I think about it, just because let's say a white friend of mine hasn't posted anything on Black Lives Matters, for me, it doesn't mean that they don't care. Mm -hmm. As you say, people, people could be scared. People could yeah. not we're also scared of saying the wrong thing. Um, people could be taking their time and doing research before they speak. 
Um, I think there's lots of reasons why people might not say something. You don't, and I feel like sometimes you don't always have to show. Obviously, we need to talk about this right now. This is time for change, mm-hmm. but you can't judge other people. Um, you just have to do what you feel is right for you to do. And if they feel moved and compelled to join in the movement, good. If, if they don't feel it's their time to join this movement, good for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's something that's very individual. You need to feel it for yourself. You can't pretend to care. Yeah. And, and just because you don't post, sorry, doesn't mean you don't care as well. You, you could be processing it differently because for example for me i've not been able to watch the george floyd video i've been saving my, i've been getting my mental headspace ready because i know it's going to be scarring and some people could actually just be scared what to say how to comprehend what is actually happening in the world right now yeah i did i have i didn't actually see the images i have mm. Awful. I just can't. I can't. I yeah. just, I just couldn't like to see someone. I get emotional. Yeah, but but that's but that's just it. It's like just going back to what you said, Areka. It's not about processing the black and black in black and white. The guy was kneeled on his yeah, head. yeah. I saw, I, I saw the images, but I've not watched the entire length of the video. But I've seen those images, and I think, I think you would have to not be human not to be moved by that regardless of your color of your skin being knelt on for that length of time even if you set your timer now to eight minutes 46 minutes a very long time so i feel that a lot of people are moved by it but some people just don't know what to do or they might not be posting on social media but they could be donating you don't know what's happening behind closed doors they could be signing petitions they could be going to march um so i try not to watch what other people are doing i just focus on what i feel like i need to do right i need to speak up for myself i need to speak up for my black boys i need to speak up for the black community as a black woman Mm -hmm. and that's what i need to do whatever else anyone needs to do you just do you but just know that this is something that we cannot keep quiet or we cannot pretend we don't know it's happening anymore. It's happening in America, it's happening in the UK, it's happening globally. I don't personally believe that America is worse than everywhere else. It's just, it's happening to various degrees in different ways. Yeah, that's yeah. shocking. I mean, I have seen yeah. the video and it's, it's, it's shocking. And I think it was just so blatant. Did you talk to your son about this uh, in any way? Yeah, I have spoken to him and I said to him, you know, there's good and bad police because, you know, he's in, because he's four years old, he's really into the whole, what people do, what wrong. How old is your son? He's four. Is he four? What, about four, he's four and a half. What he's so that? tall. He's so <laughs> four. <laughs> Really I thought cool. I did the same, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, four. <laughs> I know, I know, he's a big, big boy. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just said to him, there's good and bad people in that. It was a very, you know, I said it in the kind of kiddie like way, you know, he's a very naughty policeman, mm. um, all like that. And I think he's obviously, I'm not going to show him the video, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, I have to, I have to say to him about, you know, law enforcement, there's good and bad. Yeah. And you know, so we spoke about it so they're fully aware mm. of what happened. Did you speak um, to oh, boys, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I did the same thing. I, 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 uh, I speak, to, I speak my voice all the time. Actually, before this, about the importance of uh, knowing who you are, where you come from, mm-hmm. and also the issue of race, and also how we all need to lead with love, really, mm-hmm. and treat everybody as equals. And I'm very happy to say they're growing up to be really wise boys and they've grown up to really just not really see people to be different because of their color because because of the color of their skin sorry Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay brilliant are you okay Nesh you look a bit teary I know I just yeah I just it that's why I felt like I can't not say anything because it just like I will never understand what it's like but I, I can't like no one deserves that. Like mm-hmm. it just, uh, it just get it just hurts. Mm-hmm. I can't understand it. So I, 
I have to speak up. That's why I did because I was emotionally, I kind of knew, I couldn't not say anything or share anything. And the thing is, it's not the first time this has happened. I think because it was just so blatant. Mm. That, you know, no, maybe, exactly. You know, if you, now we've got we've got the video cameras and our we've got the videos on our phone. Everyone's seeing it now. There's no escaping yeah. it. There's no but hiding there, it. And there's no excuses anymore. To, to, to pretend that this is not happening or wishful thinking that racism is, is something of the past. It's yeah. still going on right now. And this is the time to do something about it. Absolutely. No, thank you. Guys, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for asking me.